Good to go. Welcome everybody. Thank you. It's World Haemophilia Day on Saturday, um, April 17. The day is recognised worldwide to increase awareness of haemophilia from Willebrand disease and other inherited bleeding disorders. This year's theme adapting to change. This year's theme is adapting to change. Living during a pandemic pandemic can pose many challenges, not only for our health, but also for our mental health and well-being. We are lucky to have the speakers, Nicoletta, who's the haemophilia social worker at the Royal Prince Alfred, and Jane, who's a haemophilia social worker at the Alfred, and Lenny, who's going to talk about his own personal experience. Lenny's 28 from Melbourne and has haemophilia A, and this year he's just completed his Bachelor of Arts with degrees in music and psychology. So we look forward to hearing from Lenny as well. So let's start off. I'm going to hand over to Nicoletta and Jane. Hi, thank you for having us. It's um, a real honour to be asked to speak at um, this web webinar for World Haemophilia Day. Uh, Nicoletta and I are hoping to have a conversation. Um, we wanted to keep it a bit less formal and talk about uh, resilience, um, well-being, mental health, and um, ha having a, a life that is um, embraces change. So I'm going to um, ask Nicoletta um, a question and then um, she will hopefully give us some lovely answers and we'll continue like that. Um, what is, um, Nicoletta, can you tell us what is resilience and when is it useful in responding to our mental wellbeing? Hello, everyone. Thank you, Jane. Um, lovely intro. And um, yeah, I guess to, to start things off, resilience, um, my interpretation of it and, and sort of what, what is out there in the literature is that it's... Um, it's overcoming adversity. It's it's bouncing back from the difficulties and challenges and, and recovering from those challenges that we experience all, all the time in life. Um, and so I guess what why is it useful um, for our mental well-being? Well, um, people that that struggle with um, being resilient or have poor resiliency skills are actually um, prone to experiencing mental health issues like depression and anxiety. Um, you know, people that have um, poor resilience are also more likely to, to crumble and, and break down when I guess an issue is thrown at them or a, a challenge is, you know, put their way. Um, and they're also less likely to seek support and link in um, with with their support networks. Um, so they tend to be um, more socially isolated as well, I guess. Um, I get the, the lovely thing about um, resilience is that it, it is something that we can always work on and build up. And, you know, we, we just, it's not that you have it or you don't, we can, we can all develop it. And I think that that is one amazing thing about it. And it's for kids, it's for adults, it's for older people. So there's there's always an opportunity there. Um, and so that's really important for our mental well-being uh, as well. And so um, how do we build up our resiliency? Well, that is through linking in with um, people, linking in with your social networks, your friends, your family, linking in with community organisations like the HFA. Um, or your state organization, linking in with the bleeding disorder community, and even linking in with Jane and I and people at the HTC and the staff there um, is also really important in building up those skills so that you've got someone to talk through those challenges with and to get an understanding of what's going on. That I think is key. Communicating is, is a big part of resilience um, and working through problems. Um, I know patients that I've worked with and I, um, that, that come to me with, with difficulties or, or unwelcomed changes or bad news, um, one of the things that I tend to do is we, we reflect back on past 
um, issues or challenges that they've experienced and we explore um, how they've worked through that problem and how they've overcome it in the past. And you kind of use that as a tool bag um, or a toolkit to then work through the current problem that you might have. Um, so that that ability to reflect and um, reflect on past challenges in, in a positive way helps build your resilience as well. Um, Practicing self-compassion is so important for our mental well-being and for resilience and, and developing that skill. Um, the self-compassion is being kind to yourself. It's not beating yourself up when something uh, doesn't work out or doesn't go your way or, um, you know, you're, you've struggled with something. It's, it's okay to not get things right. Um, I know I definitely uh, at times have been the harshest critic of myself and, you know, it doesn't get me anywhere. It just actually makes the situation worse or makes me feel worse. So, you know, sometimes just being gentle and saying, you know, it's okay, you're okay and you've done a good job or you'll get through this is so important. Um, Another thing um, is self-care. And I know, Jane, us as social workers, uh, that's been something that's been drummed into us um, for a very long time, whereas I think self-care now has become a, a term that's sort of um, very common and utilised everywhere. I know we've definitely all heard it, um, especially throughout uh, the past year that's for sure but it's so crucial self-care is about giving yourself time and um, you know doing things that really top you up and make you feel confident and capable to just sort of persevere and push through things and work through issues and resolve issues um, you know for me um, my self-care tends to be at lunchtime taking a break going outside feeling the fresh air, feeling, you know, what the weather's like and, um, you know, breathing in the outside, outside of the hospital environment. Um, yeah, so I guess that in a nutshell is what I kind of take resilience to be and I guess why it's so important for our mental well-being. Um, so my question to you, Jane, is uh, how can patients best prepare themselves or treatment changes. Jane, you are on mute. Thanks, Nicoletta. That was, um, I think that all of those suggestions are relevant for um, treatment change. And I think treatment change is relevant for um, the hemophilia community at the moment because there's quite a few exciting changes happening in quite a number of people's treatment. And Whilst it's exciting, it's also quite uh, scary. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing Lenny speak because I know he's got uh, some experience in this area. But I think that making sure you've got the information you need um, and may, whether that's through doing some reading, talking to your haemophilia um, consultant, the haematologist or the, um, the rest of the team in the haemophilia treatment centre, um, talking to some other, some of your peers, if you um, have that opportunity about what it's been like. And if you um, look at any of the associations, you know, in Australia or even around the world, there's quite a few fabulous articles and um, little stories by um, people talking about their experiences, which I have found very valuable. And I think it it takes away some of the fear when you read that real, you know, real people have had um, experiences. It's all, you know, not all easy, but it does um, it does happen and the support's there. I um, think that um, the, if you've got some questions, it's good to write them down and bring them back to your HTC. And there's no silly questions and it's not, um, it, just because you've had one appointment, it doesn't mean that's, or you should have asked all your questions. If you need to come back and ask some more questions, then you need to come back and ask some more questions. And I mean, we're lucky now we have telehealth, we have the telephone and we're, you know, in, our, in my centre at least, we're always really welcome, welcoming and encouraging people to come in and, um, and, and follow up those questions. So 
I think that is probably the main ways to prepare. The only other thing I would say would be do if you know that you're a person who gets anxious or you're a person who whose mood will be affected when you've got a big change coming, then you need to be alert to what you need to do. So do the things that you can do to help be calm, you know, have a good night's sleep the night before you come in for the, to the centre. Um, stay away from the too much booze, you know, leading up to it. Do, you know, do the self-care that you can do to, to protect yourself from that anxiety rising up. But also let the people around you know that you are feeling anxious and, you know, then there can be good support for you too. So, um, you know, we've got, we can set up a plan, an individual plan for anybody who really um, feels that they need um, that kind of support and it makes all the world of difference. So I encourage that. Now, Nicoletta, I have a question for you. Um, change is an, an, an inevitable part of life. And I'd like to know, how, how do you think we can build a life that embraces change? Thanks, Jane. Uh, it's true. It is an inevitable part of life. And um, that means that we kind of need to build, build a life that does adapt and embrace change. And I guess that's, that's really where resilience comes, comes into play and really, really shines through. So having that resilience skill set and foundation is so important because you, you've got your your armor and your backbone ready for those, uh, you know, welcomed and unwelcomed changes, so to speak, uh, that are always going to be thrown our way. Um, I think some of the things that are useful uh, at embracing change um, beyond just resilience are having the ability to, to step back, um, look at the situation um, and assess what's happening, um, so that you can then then embrace the change. You don't always have to sort of go into it all guns blazing. Um, so like you were saying before, Jane, about, you know, preparing yourself for the changes in treatment, it is about, um, you know, accessing that information, asking those questions and taking time to process that, digest that and, and you know, make choices and inform decisions. Um, you know, that's, I guess, Taking time to to reflect is also so important um, because then you you're open to that change or you're ready to take it on. Um, I think also sometimes acknowledging that you don't have always have control over situations is key. So um, you know, reflecting and looking at what you can and you can't control um, in a situation is also helpful in dealing with that particular change or changes in life. Um, so I'm thinking, for example, of a patient um, who last year uh, during COVID um, lost his work, so became unemployed, was made redundant for a period of time and became unemployed. And he was on um, job keeper for a period of time. And in that time, he kind of thought about, okay, um, you know, I know that, you know, my job's going to come to an end. I know that this payment isn't going to be around forever. He thought about, um, you know, what he couldn't control, which was that things were ending. And he thought about what he could control, which was, you know, looking at uh, taking on some additional studies and looking at what other jobs in the future um, he'd like to apply for. So that was, in, that was acknowledging the changes that he could control. Uh, and then I think also um, embracing change or being prepared to embrace change, self-care. Self-care is always key, looking after yourself, topping yourself up, making sure that you are maintaining your internal or mental well-being as well as your physical well-being um, is so key. So you're topped up and, and ready to take on those new changes, new challenges, new experiences that, that come into your life. Um, so Jane, I have a question for you now. Um, when should people seek help or support if they are worried about their mental health? 
Thanks, Nicoletta. I'm also, I'm just going to um, put it out there, Lenny, I'm aware we're going to, I'm going to make this a very short answer because we need to um, have some time to hear from, from you and some questions, hopefully. So I um, think that they should seek help or support if they're worried. I think if, if people are worried about themselves, that's a great place to start. And, you know, that can be talking to their, their trusted people, their family or friends, or their health professionals, their GP or somebody in that haemophilia treatment centre or any, another setting where they have um, a relationship with, with people. And if they don't have a relationship, they can, you know, go and see a GP. It's um, very. It's not a difficult thing to do, um, and it can make the world of difference to having um, having that conversation, and and getting the help that you need, or finding out that what you're, what you're going through is is a process, and you know being able to talk through that. There is some lovely um, opportunities to have a telephone or um, like online chat um, discussions with um, some of the some of the services in the community like um, uh, Lifeline, um, Beyond Blue. And I know that Tash is going to put up some resources for um, everybody and they'll be up on um, HFA's um, web page for later on as well. Uh, and I'll put them in the chat. Thank you. Um, we, yeah, I, I think that that's probably the, the best, um, the best thing is to, to talk to, talk to somebody um, and you find out, you know, what their thoughts are. Thanks. Uh, Ta Tash, are we going to go over to Lenny now? Yeah, that's fine. Lenny, over to you. Um. Thanks, Tash. Hi, my name is Leonard, and thank you for allowing me the time to speak to you today. I have haemophilia A at 2%. However, I am treated as severe because of other medical complications resulting from birth trauma. As a result, I have other conditions. These are hydrocephalus, ABI vision loss, mild palsy and some learning difficulties. Hydrocephalus is caused by the abnormally high pressure in the brain caused by the buildup of cerebrospinal fluid. Because of this, I have a VP shunt which drains the excess spinal fluid from my brain. The next challenge is I have a rare form of ABI vision loss known as paranoid or dorsal midbrain syndrome. This means I can only see with one eye at a time and I have no control over when one eye switches off and the other one takes over. As well, both eyes have limited peripheral vision and very limited upwards and downward gaze. Because of the monocular vision, I have no depth perception and would trip over easily. The other resulting challenge is mild cerebral palsy which means that one side of my body is weaker than the other, which causes issues with balance and mobility. All the above have affected in some way my ability to learn in mainstream education. In terms of my vision impairment, technology has played a big part in my education and daily life. I started to become acquainted with the computer since prep and have learnt to touch type. Learning new software has come, also comes naturally to me. This was a real asset during the lockdown as all my classes were conducted online and we mostly worked in isolation. In addition, I had to learn a new music software on my own to complete my compositions in my final unit at university. Reading music scores was fraught with difficulty due to my vision and coordination issues. However, my piano teacher patiently encouraged me to read music notation. Because of a fear of repeated shunt revisals surgery, I never felt safe doing sports, so I gravitated towards music. As a child, I was fascinated and loved hearing the beautiful melodic sounds 
created by my aunts and cousins on the piano. With my limited vision, I would learn each part separately and then learn to coordinate both hands and then ditch the book and play from memory. My short-term memory was severely impacted by all the neurosurgeries, but my long-term memory, on the other hand, is fantastic. I was surprised to discover that due to my limited vision, my hearing is very acute and it is perfect for music. Mum helps me enlarge the pages to A3 and often she has to increase the white spaces in between the staves. As I am not involved in team sports, the classical piano is very much a solitary instrument. I picked up the clarinet and joined the school band for several years until year 12, when I had a severe cerebral bleed, which hospitalized me for six weeks. And as a result, I had to give it up. Recently, I've completed a Bachelor of Arts with two majors in music and psychology at ACU. I chose psychology because I was intrigued to discover how my brain works and how people learn in general. And even though I passed, I still don't know everything. Normally a three year course, I completed it on a half time basis due to my vision impairment. Even though I completed all of my assessments by the deadline, it was a struggle to juggle my time between reading the textbook, copious amounts of researching and completing my assignments. During the 2020 lockdown, I struggled with collaborative assignments via Zoom. My study partners thought I was being lazy and uncooperative, but I was actually just slower because it took me so long to find the relevant data on the internet. It was a dark moment in my student life, but once I told them about my vision impairment, they were more understanding. It definitely improved the whole experience. Lastly, I will talk about my experience with hemophilia. There was a time when I hated my condition. I couldn't cope with the constant injections, which caused massive needle phobia. Even with all the challenges, I now realize that I can still count my blessings. I have had excellent medical care and support, both at the RCH and currently at the Alfred. Changing my treatment from Factor Eight to Hemlibra has definitely been a godsend. When I was first told about the new regimen, I was excited as I only had to do it once a week as opposed to two to three times a week, which I needed for 22 years on factor eight. Due to my vision impairment, I have always relied on one of my parents to do the injecting either via a port or intravenously. This new treatment is subcutaneous and has meant that I can do my own injections. To my surprise, I found that the whole procedure was more straightforward and less complicated compared to the sterile procedure for the port, as there are fewer components to organize. Preparation can take place over a smaller area as it takes less time, and there is no need for complex sterile setup. With Hemlibra, you only need to swap the bottle tip as well as the injection site. With intravenous injections, I was always fearful of the needle hitting a nerve. At times the vein would hide or tissue mid infusion and the whole procedure had to start all over again. This definitely caused a lot of angst for me. When I first saw the Hemlibra kit, I was so surprised to discover how small the vial and syringe were and the little amount of product required compared to the normal factor eight. The only challenge for me was reading the fine measurements on the syringe, which I managed to overcome by purchasing a cheap pair of magnifying glasses from the local chemist. I did my first two treatments at the Alfred under the supervision of the haemophilia nurses, Penny and Megan. Since then, I've been successfully self-infusing at home. As my confidence grows, I find that the transition has been smooth and without too many hassles. Overall, the whole experience has been positive and I think it will allow me more freedom and independence in the future. For me, life now feels more in control because I can self-infuse instead of relying on my folks. And thank you for listening to my speech.
Thank you, Lenny, for sharing. That was fantastic. You can breathe now. <laughs> Definitely. No, that was great. Jane Nicoletta. Nicoletta, did you have anything to read? Or you're on mute? Oh, no, I'm sorry, I don't. Okay. That no, that's was, um, sorry. No, 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 no. Jane, anything else? I'd just like to ask Lenny a question. Thank, um, mm. First of all, I just want to say thank you, Lenny. You have, um, your story is not unfamiliar to me, but wow, you've just been doing so amazingly well. And I just think you should be incredibly proud of yourself. And you were awesome today. Yeah, thanks. Um, but I just want to know how you, what you would recommend or advise others in how did you manage to be so resilient to give this a go? I know the outcome's going well, but it was pretty, it was a lot to take on. Well, I, when I heard that, um, firstly, first of all, when I heard that Hemlipa was a subcutaneous injection, I actually, first of all, for a start, I didn't, to be honest, I didn't actually know what that was. But um, once I learned that it's, once I learned that I can, um, I don't need to find a vein or anything. I just need to inject it through the um, fatty tissue in my on my stomach. I, I found that I was actually excited because I realized I could do it myself. But then of course at the start of every like as before the start of any um new experience i've always panicked and about like what how it would um happen how what it would be like yeah and as i said and then once i was shown for the first time what the um equipment actually looked like I was actually shocked by as I said the how small everything was how and that's why I thought if I'm to do this myself because I'd need to get extra strength glasses because to be honest I was well for the first two times that I did it I was uh, I did it at the Alfred under the supervision of Penny and Megan before I was able to go home and do it myself. But I actually had to, um, for the purposes of drawing up the solution, I had to actually get dad to um, um, supervise that, to overlook what I was doing to ensure that I, I had enough. Thanks Lenny. That's really great to hear. And Lenny, my question is, is in this particular circumstance, so changing your, your treatment products, and you said you're you know, feeling a bit nervous and anxious, et cetera, how did you get over that? So was it um, speaking to the nurses at the Alfred? Was it actually researching the product that made you feel a bit better? Well, actually, um, when I researched, actually, I think it was speaking to the nurses because I remember before, I think even before March, which was when I had, but actually, I think it was from when I was told by, um, first told by, I think, it was Dr. Tran when I was first told by Dr. Tran and between then and my um, first dose, I actually researched um, Hemlibra online and the honestly, the video wasn't, I don't think it was that helpful because it just basically went through like, what it is and um how it's um what the procedure is but honestly it didn't actually say anything about how to administer it like how to like pre sorry not it 
told you how to admit, but not how to prepare it, like how to draw it up, what equipment is required and anything. So honestly, that wasn't, that was a bit of a help, but not the help that I needed. So yeah. Understood. Thank you. Now, Nicoletta and Jane, I've got one question from Facebook, please. Do you have any advice for how to deal with long surgery or injury recovery while also managing a bleed? So how to um, mentally cope, um, maybe particularly with being in hospital for long stints, I would think, um, and not being able to do anything well, if recovering from an injury? Well, um has it well to be honest like the one that i mentioned in 2012 i was kind of like for that one that was a major surgery like i was like mm. basically I was basically like immobilized. Like I, well, I wasn't allowed to move because otherwise that would dis that would um, disrupt the um, healing process. So um, that was a struggle. But the the latest one in the shunt, latest shunt revisal in two thousand and seventeen. That was more. We caught that one earlier, so that wasn't that one wasn't so. Um, um, problematic and like I could sit up and um, move about so and I think that makes it feel a whole lot better I mean of course in when you're in like recovering from surgery you, of course the you spend majority of your time confined to one room but I guess you just find things to distract yourself and occupy your time like watching educational videos and watching tv of course and other things like that yeah thank you lenny jane and nicoletta can i add one thing i think that yeah. making sure that you let people know how you're going the um obviously the social workers are amazing so you can talk to the social workers Talking to the nurses on the ward is also a wonderful thing. And they don't know unless you let them know if you're having a hard time or if you're bored or if you don't have um, any entertainment to, or the, there's no one that can come and visit you or whatever, you know, the challenges are. You need to let the, the, um, the health professionals around you know and then we can work with you on how to manage I think having something to read, something to listen to, um, people to visit if, it, if it's at all possible or people to phone you up, if, you know, that, they're the things that really make a difference. Um, and you can prepare that, you know, in advance. I, I, I'd recommend for anyone with haemophilia who, who's got a chance of having a bleed, you know, have a little kit bag of, you know, if there's something you really want to read but you don't get it around to it, pop it in a little corner or in a bag if there's some a movie you want to watch, make sure you put it download it onto a hard drive, um, that kind of thing. So you're prepared. Have you know have some technology that you can bring into the hospital with you, um, so, so that you've got some options. Yeah, and then talk to Nicoletta or myself or the social worker wherever you are, and they can help too. It's a great idea about a kit bag, My Nicoletta. My little addition also, I totally agree with everything that Jane said. I think sometimes also if you're in hospital for a long time um, is to try and create a bit of a routine because I think that, you know, if you just kind of go with the flow of what the hospital is dictating to you, which sometimes you have to do, um, but, you know, try and wake up at a set time. Um, you know, if, if you've got long stints of nothing happening, you know, make mornings reading, um, late mornings, um, you know, talking to a relative or watching a show or, you know, you've just got to kind of set a bit of a structure for yourself because that 
I think makes the day much more manageable and tolerable because I know that, yeah, for people that are in hospital for a long time, that loss of routine and sense of boredom and just it, it definitely gets gets all too much sometimes. So, yeah, that's my little addition to everything that Jane said as well. <laughs> Thank you. All right, lots of good tips there. Um, I know there's some conversation on Facebook as well, so um, you could have, head over there later. Thank you to Jane. Thank you to Nicoletta. And a big thank you to Lenny for sharing your story. You were amazing. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for joining us. And um, we'll put some tips on Facebook and, uh, and on our um, website. And happy World Hemophilia Day for Saturday. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Happy World Hemophilia Day. Yeah. <laughs>